Thanks for having me here to talk about famotidine for COVID-19. Um, so uh, you all, whatever your background, know famotidine. Even if you don't know that you know famotidine, this is sold in drugstores under the brand name Pepsid. Uh, but famotidine is a non-brand. Uh, it's a generic uh, medication. It's usually used for acid reflux, where it binds uh, the gastric parietal cell, this cell, on the base of the cell. This is the side of the cell that faces the blood at the histamine 2 receptor, and it stops the cell from exchanging hydrogen ions for potassium ions. So it's a very effective uh, treatment for reflux disease. But of course, I'm not talking about it for reflux. I'm talking about it for COVID-19. Uh, so now I'll tell you the story of how this came to be. Why am I talking about this acid suppression medicine for COVID-19? The, the other thing I should mention before I get into this is that the dose of famotidine that if you're a clinician, you're probably familiar with, is 20 milligrams or maybe up to 40 milligrams. Uh, but those will be important in this conversation. If you look back historically uh, uh, to the era before proton pump inhibitors were available for uh, peptic ulcer disease, it would be standard to give famotidine in doses of hundreds of milligrams. Uh, 640 milligrams was the daily dose of famotidine for Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which was a syndrome of hi uh, gastric hyperacidity. Uh, before we had better medications for that, like the uh, Nexium type medications. Okay, so why famotidine for COVID-19? Uh, uh, Michael Callahan, who's a specialist in infectious disease, was working in uh, Wuhan at the start of the pandemic there, and he observed that patients who had uh, gastric reflux seemed to do better after they were hospitalized compared to patients who didn't. Uh, this was just retrospective data, but he had access to a, a Wuhan-based data set. And as he looked more carefully into that data set, he saw that it was only in the patients who were on famotidine type medications, which are called histamine two receptor antagonists, not, on uh, not in patients who had gastric reflux, but were taking the other kind of medication that's usually taken for reflux called PPIs. Uh, so he was very you know, intrigued by this uh, observation, but it was observational only. There was no intervention. They weren't giving famotidine to anybody. But when he got back to the United States, he spoke to some people including Kevin Tracy at Northwell Health, which is a large, uh, mostly Long Island-based uh, healthcare network in New York. And together they commissioned a drug, mo drug modeling study uh, from uh, Alchem, uh, Robert Malone. And they targeted uh, the SARS-CoV-2 papain-like protease, the, this PL-PRO protease, um, which is involved in a sort of a middle step in uh, viral replication. It's not the polymerase that we heard about from Mark Dennison, it's later on uh, cleaving some of those uh, early viral proteins out of the preproteins. But they thought that this would be a good drug target. Um, and uh, they modeled famotidine against the, the different binding pockets on this PL pro protease uh, and found that it would be uh, predicted to bind and inactivate the PL pro protease, but it required a high concentration, uh, not the kind of uh, serum concentration that uh, they thought uh, people would be likely to get taking it at that standard. 20 milligram a day dose, it would require more like a minimum of 80 milligrams uh, oral, uh, perhaps even more. Uh, okay, so we'll let that thread sit for a moment and then ask, is there other evidence we can go to about famotidine as a kind of an antiviral? And if you look back in the literature, look back to the 1990s before we had uh, better medicines for HIV, you'll find a number of case series uh, documenting uh, patients who are on histamine 2 receptor antagonists uh, who have HIV or AIDS-associated syndromes uh, and had this observed clinical improvement. You know, these are our case series, again, not interventional data, but these are people with uh, syndromes like Kaposi's sarcoma or HIV-associated psoriasis, and all of a sudden they were taking famotidine or uh, cimetidine, which goes under the brand name of Tagamet, and getting better. And it was thought that this was probably an immune mechanism, um, that it was a actually an anti-inflammatory effect because lymphocytes have histamine 2 receptors, not that it was a direct antiviral mechanism. Uh, but there is one uh, study, which is cited here from the late 1990s, where they tested this hypothesis. Is it immune mediated or is it actually an antiviral? And this study from 1996 concluded that actually famotidine and even more so cimetidine or tagamet seems to perhaps have anti-HIV viral activity. These are um, lymphocytes, so the top line is lymphocyte viability, that's unchanged, but if you look at P24 as a marker of HIV replication, it goes down in this 
a dose response uh, manner uh, with histamine two receptor antagonists. Now, this is a long time ago, and by the late 1990s, better medications were coming online for HIV, so this really wasn't pursued. This, uh, this study didn't go anywhere. Is there other evidence? There's one more drug modeling study. Again, just using, this is not in vitro, this is in silico, using computers to model the uh, proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. But this is uh, an untargeted study, so these authors had no uh, particular bias for or against famotidine. They picked not just the PL-PRO protease, but um, a number of SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteins. They looked at 14 different binding sites across those proteins, and then screened the uh, largest available database of drug compounds. And they also found that famotidine was a top hit, predicting uh, that it would bind to and inactivate one of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. But they predicted that it would not inactivate the PL-PRO protease, but the three CL-PRO protease. So they also uh, like famotidine, but now it's a different, uh, different protein that they're predicting that it'll bind to. So if we add up the evidence to date, what do we have for famotidine? We have this reported experience in Wuhan. This is unpublished data. We have these old studies of HIV uh, replication, uh, one in vitro study, but the mechanism really is not uh, clear. And then we have these two drug modeling studies. It's nice that we have two studies. Uh, they would seem to validate each other, but they actually predict binding to different proteins. So at this point, um, with this evidence, uh, Kevin Tracy and Joe Canigliaro of Northwell Health applied for funding to do a randomized controlled trial testing for modity um, in humans. Uh, so uh, this trial was funded. It uh, began, they had enrolled uh, as of about four weeks ago, something like 150 patients, and then the pandemic began to slow. And they knew that based on their power calculation for the trial, that they would be unable to uh, meet the power calculation for the trial. They reached out to a number of people, including the chief of my division, uh, Timothy Wong, uh, to seek other trial enrollment sites so that they could reach the numbers that they would need to really test this and get an answer one way or the other. Uh, Tim then uh, turned to me and my friend and colleague, Julian Abrams, because we've done a lot of work related to acid suppression medications. He presented us with this, uh, this evidence uh, and asked us, you know, do we want to participate in Northwell's clinical trial testing for motidine for COVID-19? We said, well, it's very interesting and intriguing, but uh, first we'd like to look back. Let's look at the Columbia data. Now we're, uh, we're in sort of late April. Um, we have enough clinical data. Can we replicate the, these observations that uh, we've heard about in Wuhan? If we can, then yes, let's go ahead and participate in the clinical trial. And if not, maybe that makes us a little uh, more reluctant to uh, go ahead and join Northwell. Maybe we think it'll be a lower yield kind of an intervention. So now with the rest of the slides, I'll present uh, the retrospective study, um, really uh, mirroring um, uh, this report uh, from the uh, Wuhan data. Uh, so this is in Columbia data. How did we do this study? We looked at patients who were hospitalized with COVID-19 from February 25th to April 13th, and they had to have COVID-19 diagnosed within 72 hours, uh, using the nasopharyngeal PCR. That 72 hours uh, window may sound like a, a wide window. We have to recall that in the early days of the pandemic, it was taking us a long time to turn around this test uh, clinically. So really these are people who are presenting with COVID-19, not uh, who are acquiring COVID-19 after they've presented with something else. We excluded patients who died or were intubated within 48 hours of hospital admission. We felt that it was implausible that um, a single dose or even a couple doses of famotidine would turn around a patient who is you know, crashing, about to be intubated in the emergency room. The primary exposure for this retrospective study was famotidine given within 24 hours of hospital admission, and it could be any dose or duration. Uh, and the primary outcome was death or intubation, uh, and it was a time to event type analysis. We did the study or closed the analytic data set on April 20th, so that gave us a minimum opportunity for seven days of follow up for all the patients. And then uh, we followed patients for up to a maximum of 30 days for that outcome of death or intubation. Uh, okay, so who received famotidine? 5% of the cohort uh, received famotidine within 24 hours of hospitalization. Um, so that was 84 patients. And then you could ask, well, why are they getting famotidine? Um, uh, famotidine is given in the ICU uh, as uh, prevention for stress ulcers, but famotidine is not routinely given uh, in medical floor patients for stress ulcers. So 
presumably it's not being given for that reason. Why is it being given? Well, our hypothesis is that it was being continued as a home medication. That's what they uh, uh, saw in the Wuhan data. Can we prove that? Um, a medication reconciliation needs to be done at the time of hospital admission in all patients. This is a necessary step in the electronic medical record. Uh, but the medication reconciliation is quite imperfect. And that's especially true for medications like famotidine, which is available over the counter. So we found documentation that famotidine was a home med on the med rec in 15% of the famotidine users and 1% of the non-users. So that's a statistically significant difference, but it still leaves 85% of the patients without a clear explanation for why they were taking famotidine. We then looked at a subset of the charts and we found that 55% of the famotidine users had either uh, reflux documented on their admission note or they had home use of famotidine documented in the medication, uh, the, the uh, medicine admission note. So 55%, that's not bad, but still 45%, we can't say for certain uh, why the famotidine was continued in the hospital. Uh, what doses of famotidine did they receive? Um, most of it was oral, uh, uh, about a, a third to a quarter was IV. Uh, here are the doses, nearly 20 to 40 milligrams on average for people. Uh, the median follow-up time was 5.8 days and the uh, median dose over that time was 136 milligrams of famotidine. So that's consistent with the sort of standard home dose of about 20 milligrams a day. Uh, here are the patients in the study, um, looking back. Uh, if you look across their sort of uh, baseline characteristics, they're actually quite well aligned. Um, I, uh, Julian uh, Abrams, my colleague and I, do a lot of work with uh, proton pump inhibitors, and we see a problem uh, this is a common problem in pharmacoepidemiology. When you study people who use drugs, the people who use drugs tend to do worse than people who don't use the drugs, whatever the drugs and uh, whatever the reasons they're using them for. Uh, use of any kind of medication is just a marker for comorbidity that's difficult to adjust for. Uh, but in famotidine, that's uh, uh, much less the case than it is for other medications like proton pump inhibitors. And so it's not surprising that we see that these patients are really pretty well uh, uh, well aligned as far as their baseline characteristics. There are some slight differences, like here in the initial oxygen requirement, there are some slight differences, and we can use statistics to make those differences go away as much as possible. Uh, here's the primary outcome of the study. So we're following these patients beginning on hospital day two for an outcome of death or intubation for up to 30 days, and there's a strong protective association with famotidine. So this is a hazard ratio of 0 0.4. That's a two to three fold a protective association. And if you ask, is it intubation or death? Um, really, it's death more than intubation that uh, drives this association. Um, this is uh, showing the same uh, analysis, but for death only. Here's the final um, Cox proportional hazards model. So now we've adjusted for comorbidities. The strongest predictors of uh, death, or death or intubation in this population, no surprise, uh, older age above 65. Um, or the initial oxygen requirement. So this is the uh, form of oxygen supplied immediately after triage of the patient. Um, the patients were put on a non-rebreather, which is a kind of a face mask. Down your two minutes, Mark. Okay, thanks. That supplies high flow oxygen. Um, uh, um, uh, did worse. Uh, here's a propensity score matched cohort. So we're just balancing even better the baseline characteristics of the patients. You can see now an initial oxygen requirement really no differences between the promoting users and the non-users, same two to three-fold association. Uh, and then in my last two minutes, I'll just quickly talk about the RCT. So we finished this retrospective study. This is now available on MedRxRV, uh, MedRxIV online, uh, and it'll be in gastroenterology online uh, shortly. And we joined the Northwell RCT. Um, so here's the RCT. It gives a big dose of promotidine, 360 milligrams IV, same kinds of patients, same kinds of outcomes. Uh, current status, um, uh, they need 1,200 patients to detect a reduction of 13% baseline mortality to 7.2%. They'd enrolled, uh, it, now this is over 200, but as of April 28th, it was 190. Um, uh, we got our IRB approved on April 20th. We enrolled one patient and then we held the study because the study initially included hydroxychloroquine because it was designed about eight weeks ago when hydroxychloroquine was thought to be beneficial. And now we have had more clinical experience with hydroxychloroquine. We think that's probably not the case. There's probably not a big benefit. Uh, and we've removed hydroxychloroquine using an adaptive study design. 
a lot of people uh, have helped out. So uh, thank you. And now I'll take questions. Thank you, Dan. Um, so uh, Ira. Um... Hi, Dan. Um, so uh, what about the control arm that used PPI? Uh, so yeah, so I, um, yeah, for the sake of time, I didn't present that data. If you look at PPIs as a control, which we did do, um, you find the PPI users do worse uh, than the PPI non-users. The hazard ratio for that was something like 1.5. If you adjust for differences in baseline comorbidities, you see that the PPI users are a lot sicker than the non-users. And that's true across PPI studies. Most, but not all of that difference goes away. And the, uh, the harmful association drops to uh, around 1.3 uh, with a confidence that almost crosses the null. The, the other uh, sort of sensitivity analysis that I didn't uh, mention that we did is we also looked at famotidine use in non-COVID patients during this same study period. Um, so there were about 750 patients admitted uh, between uh, February and April, uh, early April uh, for non-COVID reasons. Uh, do we see a protective association of famotidine in those non-COVID patients? And the answer is that, that we don't. So that was kind of another uh, sanity check for us. Thank you, uh, and uh, uh, Neville? Yeah, hi. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts about the fact that the intubation rates weren't uh, different, if the, given that the majority of patients who die you know, are probably intubated, and does have to do with early deaths before intubation? Yeah, so um, uh, a lot of patients uh, uh, died during this study period without intubation. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of patients were intubated uh, who, when the study was performed, uh, did not yet die, but probably ultimately will. So uh, one of the things we're uh, in the process of doing is to revisiting this exact same data set now with more follow-up time and seeing in those patients who uh, you know, were intubated, uh, is there a truly a mortality benefit or not? I would hypothesize that there's not, that if, um, uh, once you get intubated, uh, anything that is a possible antiviral probably doesn't make much difference. Uh, that, that would be my, my guess, but I, I can't uh, give you evidence of that. 